we're a little bit odd because we do several different things. So we're an exhibit that's open to the public. We have around 80 species or so on exhibit right now. And uh, we also do outreach programs and that sort of thing to uh, bring reptiles into schools, into parks, and basically whoever wants us. The other thing we do, of course, is provide venom for medical research purposes. And I've been here for, gosh, I guess about 22 years now. So um, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people. Um, and also just, I guess I've kind of developed my own opinion about what I think uh, we should be doing. So first and foremost, I definitely think that if an animal is in captivity, then it should be useful in as many ways as possible. So you know, we've already taken it out of the wild. Its genetics aren't out there anymore. It's not really doing what it's supposed to do as an animal. So I think that the, you know, it, for that reason, it should contribute as much as possible in other ways. So that's why we kind of have both things where we're interacting with the public and open to them and then also doing the venom production. So that's kind of my philosophy anyway on how I look at things. So, um, we also make our animals available to researchers who are doing any sort of non-invasive research. So anything from like, you know, looking at skin or blood for DNA to behavioral things to, um, you know, kind of whatever we, um, we try to make them available. Probably the neatest thing I've done recently, actually, I don't even know if Doug knows about this is, uh, we had someone who's looking at the uh, actual injury that's caused by the fang. And so they made mice out of ballistic gel. And we uh, made like a, a warm bath of smelly mouse water and put them in there and then uh, showed them to the snakes. And uh, then they were able to actually, they, I think they used like a, uh, some sort of dental material, I'm not positive, to actually uh, get the track of the fang. And so they're looking at, does the type of injury that the fang cause actually influence how the venom is deposited uh, within the bite? So that was kind of interesting. All right. So can you see it? <laughs> this is the, this is one of the mice. I was highly entertained by this. <laughs> so it, it, hopefully, they are working on the manuscript now, so hopefully before too long that'll actually be out somewhere, but I thought that was pretty cool. So that's just kind of one example of, of the kind of things that we do. Uh, I also think, and I actually, uh, one of the things I've spoken about is that I really feel like people who work with venoms so people who are studying them for cancer research or that sort of thing, for example, I really feel like they have um, a duty then to contribute towards conservation in the wild somehow. So even if that's just donating money or maybe volunteering their time or kind of whatever, you know, those animals are contributing venom that might end up saving people. So I sort of feel like it should be a two-way street and the people who are working with it and benefiting from that should also... Um, be, you know, contributing to the snake's welfare as well. So uh, that's kind of the, the uh, philosophy that I've ended up with, I guess. And then uh, the other thing that I was just going to mention is a little bit about venom extraction and the health of the snakes in general. I really feel like, um, you know, Jim started Kentucky Reptile Zoo because he, he felt like you could extract venom from snakes without harming them. And the historical kind of old fashioned way was to just collect snakes from the wild and extract from them until they died. And that's obviously not sustainable or ethical. And so uh, that was Jim's philosophy when he started uh, the zoo here. And it certainly makes sense to me. And so we do a lot of things to try to make the stress level of the snakes as low as possible when we're not extracting because we subject them to extraction that's obviously a stressful event so then everything else about their life should be as nice as we can make it so that's obviously an abundance of food and all of those things but also i really don't believe in handling an animal any more than is necessary 
So normally I've done a couple of uh, Zoom programs for little kids and the teacher will attempt to mute them, but it's like they obviously know how to unmute themselves. So there's like this constant battle between you can see the teacher like muting them and then they'll like turn it back on and say something. <laughs> the very first one we did during the virus stuff, it was a group of second graders and they hadn't seen each other since the schools were closed. This was like their first thing. And uh, the teacher had told them that it was going to be like she told them it was going to be us. And she said that all of them should bring an animal also, like either their pet or a stuffed animal. And these kids all had like adorable like puppies and kittens. And then they had like cute little stuffed animals that they were like showing to the camera. I was dying. It was so cute. <laughs> so anyway, it's totally been really different. I don't know. Has anyone else done programs this way? Have you done some? Yeah, yeah, we've done uh, we've done what we call virtual tours, and oh, like all, yeah, entire classrooms, <laughs> and we, we've walked through and um, looked at all of the exhibits. But we've also done some detailed ones on just reptiles or animal camouflage or things like that as well. And but yeah, the same thing as the kids are constantly <laughs> covering yeah. top of our It's really <laughs> fun. <laughs> yeah. Are are you actually carrying around like a laptop and pointing it at things? Or are you doing it with a phone? How is that? How are you doing that? For whose? His For or like mine? Virtual tour. Are you oh. like carrying around in the facility? Like we've done both. We've done it with the computer, but it's easier to do with just the phone. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, so we've we've done it with that, but then we'll we'll have a laptop open to where we can see the screen of the multiple people and all that fun stuff going on, uh, so you can get a a little more personal uh, when they ask questions and such. Yeah. But it's yeah. Um, it's different. It's it's a new way of doing things, and uh, I think thank God someone else knows the technology because <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I get you on that. Yeah, I'm doing definitely. one this Friday for a library, and it's going to be live, and they're going to somehow the library has the ability to take a Zoom meeting, which is how I'm going to connect to them, and then they're going to broadcast that through their Facebook Live to people. I, I didn't know that that was a thing you could do, but that's apparently what they're how they're going to do it. So yeah. interesting. I don't know. Sorry, I didn't really have anything to do with snakes, but it was. <laughs> Laura's talk that she just did, I guess they did the same type of a thing. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. You can do PowerPoints and everything on them yeah. now. It's, uh, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. I knew you could, like, share your screen. Like, I think I could even do that here if I had something to show you, but I, I don't because this is a newer computer. <laughs> yeah. There's not really much on it. I don't have a lot of pictures. <laughs> but... Jim's making faces in the off camera. <laughs> <laughs> Did I, who's doing the, who's doing the uh, the study on the on the snake things on the bite? Um, the student's name is Paige Ringo. Okay. And the professor is Dominic Demore. I think is his last name. Okay. Is that right? Jim says that's right. He's he's actually a paleontologist primarily, um, but I think she was interested in snakes, and so he was trying to you know help the student obviously. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting. He's yeah he's doing that's yeah I'm right that's who it is. Okay. I'm trying to remember what university it is, and I don't remember right now, but I could look it up if you want to know. Um, I'm not seeing any cool dino pics, but that that was correct. That was who it was. <laughs> okay. Very cool. So, yeah, it, it to me it would be interesting. I, you know, when I was at the the venom lab, uh, I started collecting a bunch of different fangs from different types of snakes. You know, you kind of do that as you as you have them. But I noticed uh, even on atrox that you would get from various localities different curvatures of the fang, not necessarily yeah. based on, on age. And so that got me thinking, okay, well, may, it's probably prey-related, the fangs, um, the shape of the fangs to the prey. 
And uh, we're, like, if you look at the, the fang from an eastern diamondback, the adamantius, they curve down and, and then right at the end, they curve back out. Yep. And, yeah, just that little bit. Yep. Yeah. And so it's to me, it's more of a stabbing. You know, they, they, eat, they feed on these rabbits. And if you watch them in slow motion, they do. They do more of a stab than an overhand bite on these things. Yeah. And um, so I talked once, I think, uh, a long time ago with Harry Green about it. He's, oh, you really need to study this and write it up. I've just never had a chance to. <laughs> That's why the uh, what you guys are doing is of interest to me on the, on the bite mechanics. Have you that. seen Dave Kundal's videos? No. Oh, my gosh. So uh, David Kundal. Uh, C-U-N-D-A-L-L. -L. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I believe he has, uh, he's, I don't know if he's still actively working. I think he was close to retirement, um, so he might not be there anymore. But he was at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. And he visited us, but also a lot of other zoos. And he did a high-speed video of snakes striking. Oh, cool. And so he, oh man, the videos are incredible. Um, but what you're describing, a lot of them would pull the fangs erect, strike, you know, like if this is the rodent, they strike over the rodent, grab it like this, and then like flip up. And when they do that, the rodent gets like tumbled through the air. And I assume the point of that is to kind of disorient it and make it harder for it to run as far or something. But, um, it was super interesting to see in slow motion. And he also discovered that the snake can, um, like, if it, if it bites and then hits, like, the skull or the scapula or something like that, mm -hmm. the, the snake will pull the thing out and reposition it so that it can actually penetrate into the body uh, deeper. Yeah. You know, they do that within the time of the strike. So That's however, incredible. You know, fractions of a second, that is, they can... They can do all of that in that period of time. Yeah, it's just amazing. And he has uh, a few videos, at least, or at least he did last time I looked. If you search his name and go to his university page, you can find those videos. Um, it's just, it's incredible. They're really neat. The, the one, the best one that ever happened while he was visiting us, he didn't get the video. And it was a young Bothrops something or other. Uh, I don't remember what species it was now. Probably was a young uh, Bothrops atrox from a, from Colombia. I feel like that's the right time. And at the time, we were feeding them frogs. And so we had it in a little, like, um, five or seven-gallon aquarium, like this size. Yeah. And he had the – and the snake was, like, this long. <laughs> it was really tiny. And uh, he had the camera so that it was aimed at, like, the entirety of the aquarium. And we had it in there, and we put the frog in there, and the frog jumped, like, up towards the top, right? And we didn't have the lid on it because it was in this other bigger arena thing. And uh, the frog jumped, like, it's aiming out of the aquarium. And as it did, the snake struck, and it, it like, struck up, out, like, upside down. You can't see it because it goes out of the frame and actually catches the frog in the air. <laughs> and then comes back down. It, it's amazing. <laughs> That's cool. It's, he was so mad that he missed it because <laughs> he couldn't. He didn't actually see the point of contact because it, it struck further than any of us would have guessed that it would be able to do. It was it was amazing, um, yeah. and almost like straight up in the air too. It was just phenomenal. So yeah, he's done some really cool stuff. He also figured out how snakes drink. Uh, it took him years. So, you know, when they put their mouth in the water, right. and then they, they go like this, yeah. which we've all seen them, them doing. So he thinks he's worked out that what's happening is they have, like, microfolds in the lining of their mouth. And so when they move the jaw outwards, they're actually, like, the lining of the mouth becomes kind of like a sponge. It spreads those folds out, and the mm -hmm. water moves by capillary action into those folds. And then when they compress it again, it gets pushed out of the folds back oh, into the throat. Interesting. You know, they're, not, they're not sucking it up, yeah. obviously. <laughs> right. So they can't do that. 
But I always thought that was really cool, too, because, you know, you see snakes put their mouth in the water, but it's not real obvious how they're getting it to go down because they they don't tilt their head back until the very right. end, typically, you know? So it's like that he thinks that's how it works um, when they drink. So he's super interesting to talk to. He's really a neat guy. Um, so cool. that's one of the other things we did that I, I really enjoyed was was that uh, getting to watch him do the videos. Um, he did mostly vipers and pit vipers when he was here. I don't think he's done a lot with the lapids, um, which I'm sure is like entirely different, you know, right. how, obviously how they strike and stuff. But I was going to tell you that uh, Dominic and Cage with the with the with the mice were interested in where is the venom deposited along that fang injury. So, right. like, are they making a pocket and putting the venom in there? Are they just putting it in, you know, throughout the entire strike? Uh, and I don't, I don't know that the that anybody knows the answer to that question. I think we we all might have a theory, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I don't know that we know that for sure. So, yeah, I'm not sure I'm convinced it makes that much difference. You know, like if the venom is yeah, especially in a prey situation if the venom is deep in the body in any spot i think the rodent's you know a goner kind of no matter right. what anyway so it doesn't really matter if it's in one particular place or another i don't know but it's an interesting question it might make a little yeah. bit of difference in the progression of a bite to a human if it's you know deposited more deeply or less but i'm not sure it matters for prey so, but yeah. I, I don't know. It's interesting anyway. It is interesting. I, it's something I had never really thought about. Yeah. It's, you would think, yeah, if it created a little pocket, it would make more sense than to distribute it all the way down. And then as the fang pulls out, to pull venom back out with it, you know, just on the surface. Yeah. I mean, of course, I guess if, if the flesh is tightened around it, it's probably not going to take that much um, take that much back with it but you know, yeah it is interesting. I think the flesh is all moving around anyway so yeah probably staying in there but um oh aging snakes you know aging snakes is interesting they absolutely senesce and get old you can tell they start to get uh like loss of muscle tone when they get kind of saggy looking i think their heads start to look kind of it's hard to describe it. I don't know that it's anything really specific that I notice. It's just a combination of things. I think the loss of muscle tone sometimes makes the bones a little bit more prominent looking in the head. And then they also just, you know, they've been around a while, so they've bumped into things or rubbed on stuff and their skin may not be quite as perfect um, on their face anymore. Um, we, we kind of do both as far as like, do we keep them until they die or do we euthanize them? We don't necessarily euthanize something just because it isn't producing venom very well, but, you know, most things as they start to really age, their quality of life seriously declines. And usually if we can tell that that's happening, then we'll euthanize them. Uh, we had a, a Protolus atrox a number of years ago that was a huge producer. It gave over two grams every time we extracted from it. it the thing was a monster. Um, it was a big female from, uh, like down near Brownsville and she was probably, probably that big around just good size. I don't think she was record length at all, but she was just big and her venom glands were so large that the, her mouth actually, her upper like labials overhang, overhung her lower labials. <laughs> so she was a bulldog. <laughs> um, I think she was just a genetic freak. Like she just she came to us that way and was that way. I, I I don't think she was born here, but I think we'd had her since she was relatively small. Uh, but at any rate, in her old age, she developed some arthritis in her spine, and there was a section of her body she could not really move, and she developed a pressure sore there eventually. And we did a whole bunch of things. Like, I, she didn't move around a whole lot at that point. I actually put her up on supports to try to give that sore time to heal. 
and it was clear it was just getting it's like a pressure storm mm -hmm. of human man it just gets worse and worse and it, so we did end up euthanizing her because i just thought it was it wasn't doing her a favor to keep her alive with that condition um and i've had other really old snakes we had uh, um, a sudacus a couple of years ago that uh developed some neurological problems in its old age and uh we euthanized it as well because it, it couldn't figure out how to eat right and it would it would like grab the rat and then kind of like its head would turn too far sideways to be able to swallow properly and you know when those problems are happening it's not the kindness to keep them alive um but i have had some that just we knew were kind of old and then one day they were dead so you know that happens too that they they end up getting liver or kidney failure sometimes i think just like people or anything you know dogs and cats get that sort of stuff when they get old so um they're I'm trying to think about production. I think that it maybe does decline some, but it's not its not as much as you would necessarily think. And I think if we really start to notice that it's declining, we've re basically retired them from extractions at that point. Um, like certainly that big Atrox we had stopped extracting from um, at the very least several months before she developed that sore. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't think it declines a whole lot until they're really close to death. But the oldest thing we have is a crate, a uh, many banded crate, Bungaris multisynctus, and it's in its late 40s right now. Um, Jim, it's been here for 30 years or something, like basically as long as Jim has had the zoo, and then the Columbus Zoo had it for many years and it, they did they got it as an adult out of the wild decades ago so that's the oldest one that we know we have currently we don't really extract from it very often because we we we'd only have a couple of crates and you don't get much out of them so it's not like something we're producing a bunch of and you can't tell that snake is old except for that his face has that little bit of a rough look but his muscle tone is really good and he eats like clockwork and crawls around, doesn't seem slow, is still really coordinated. So I don't know, I should knock on wood or something now that I'm saying that about him, but he's uh, <laughs> he's been hanging in there for a long time. It doesn't seem to really be declining much. So we'll see, I don't know. Be interesting to see how long he, he makes it. <laughs> but I don't know. Doug, what do you think the oldest snake you've worked with is? I don't know, I mean, I've had, we had a pair of Willard eye uh, that actually bred for us uh, and they were collected as adults about oh. 30 years prior wow. uh, to that and because it blew me away that they, and it was the first time that they ever, ever bred as, as a pair and I know I was talking to Mike Price the other day about uh, the subocularia and he said, well, I've got one I could give you. He said, but I tell you, I caught it as an adult back in 91. And uh, <laughs> so that stick's got some age on it, too. And um, I, so, I, you know, I used to have this debate with, with um, people about elephants, too. As you know, oh, elephants can live to be 75 years old. And it's like, well, yeah, people can live to be 120, but it doesn't mean we all do. And right. I think occasionally you get... Um, you just get some specimens that they just got good long genes and they, you know, they've lived life w well, I guess. So, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, I, you know, I've seen them get up into the thirties and stuff easily. And, uh, um, I imagine some probably go beyond that. If you're looking at big, big, um, uh, uh, you know, some of the big constrictors and stuff, I guess could probably maybe even surpass that. So. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, like I don't know. I think I have a, I have a mental image of them living longer if they're in the scenario where they're really fed very rarely. But I yeah. think many of them that, I mean, certainly how we feed ours normally, that are in captivity are fed much more regularly than they would eat in the wild. And I wonder if they live a lot less long because of that. Because now we know they do that whole like kind of physiological shutdown in the fasting time. Right. Uh, like, do they, if, if they're not doing that, do their organs not last as long? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but I wonder about that. 
I mean, there are people who keep them and do feed them that way. Um, yeah. But a lot of people get them and they just want them to be big, so they just yeah. give them lots and lots of food. So, you know, yeah, I would, I would guess that, well, you know, I maybe not. I was going to say, I, I would think that um, probably your more sedentary snakes tend to tend to live longer but you know the that crate you have i mean in the wild those are some mobile snakes <laughs> right, so, right, yeah, so that, yeah. yeah so as soon as i thought that i thought well there it goes that crate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> it's hard since we never know how old a snake is it's hard to know what happened to it we had an actract aspis um uh Viber and I, that uh, actually, it was Harry Green's animal that he got from the shed in 91, and it died last year. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> you know, that's pretty crazy. I doubt it was a baby, <laughs> you yeah. know, but when he got it. But, yeah, so pretty interesting. Very cool. I saw a question about uh, corals. <laughs> How long do coral snakes live? Oh. I saw that question just pop up. Oh, I haven't seen it yet, but okay. I don't know. Um, I mean, we've had, them, we've had them live for quite a few years, but I don't, we don't have a large amount of them. We've only ever had a handful at any one time. Um, and I never know how old they are when we get them. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I, I would put them in the category of a shorter lifespan just because they're smaller and, like you say, tend to have a quicker manner. You know, they move quick. They move around a lot. I kind of agree with you on that. So right. Maybe the crate's just an outlier. Um, but the, to me, the most fun thing about keeping a coral snake is just seeing how many different kinds of snakes I can get it to eat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> they eat anything. They do. <laughs> I fed them all sorts of things from, you know, like stillborn babies from, uh, you know, cobras and uh, Malayan pit vipers. I know they, they've eaten those for us. Uh, baby rattlesnakes that were stillborn. Um, just all sorts of things you would, you know, they never encounter in the wild because they're not even from the same continent, but they're just like, okay, whatever. Right. <laughs> they eat it. I've heard that other people have that same, same, uh, experience too i don't think i'm special in that regard i think they just are happy to eat anything once you get them going they're they're pretty good eaters <laughs> yeah i've never uh the ones that i've always kept you know we kept on the venom line and we did the uh you know the old bill haas jack facenti thing and and just yeah. tubed, yeah. Them, tubed them when we fed them um yeah. and I've, I've only kept them at home you know, i'll keep for about a year or so and turn them loose where I found them or something and uh oh yeah uh, so yeah I, I couldn't begin to tell you how long they live in captivity I know we had some on the venom line that were there when we first opened at the NTRC but you know you're only talking five six seven years at that point um that that we had them so it's you know it's I couldn't I couldn't answer that whole question on that but uh uh you know I I have heard that the um that the Easterns tend to, you know, the, the fulvias do tend to eat better than, than perhaps the tenor. And yeah, uh, yeah. certainly the, the microoides. I've never kept a microoides, so I don't know about those. I haven't had microoides either. We've had tenor eat that same wide variety of things. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Um, I've had more of those than I have a fulvius. Um, right now, we only have a fulvius. Um, and honestly, like Jack does that venom and so they're such hard work to take care of and do all yeah. that with that I, I I'm just like we don't we don't need to do it he's got it and it was no point I've never bred them I see um so I have a feeling if, if they're if they're doing well they're probably not that hard to breed I would expect yeah yeah Tim says he's bred them and they're not hard to breed he says the juveniles are hard to get to eat, which I <laughs> yeah, a little bitty. And they're so little, you probably couldn't tube feed them or anything because you just rupture everything trying to, I would imagine. Yeah. It's hard to be careful enough to do. But um, yeah, they're, 
they are neat snakes. I really would like to work one day with some of the bigger ones from South America. Um, that would be really cool, but it hasn't hasn't happened yet. So we'll see. Have you ever worked with any of those? I, I, I have not. I, I would love to. I, yeah, I yeah. love the coral snakes. I would love to um, yeah. to definitely have you know try some of those out, but. No, just mainly, uh, you know, I had fulvius in the past, but, you know, mainly tenor. The only uh, only microoides that I personally ever had was what I found out by uh, uh, rodeo and portal rodeo, and it disappeared in a rental car. I never did find it. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, here you go, thank you. Jordan, I'm not sure you should have said that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, some of those big South American ones are just such impressive snakes. I would love to be able to work with them at some point. Yeah, Jim Jim's trying to tell us that he he kept one of the Suriname Surinamensis once, oh. yeah, but like one years ago. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. He says it came through Pet Farm. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. So, Connor, that's one of the old animal dealers that's no longer in business here in the U.S., but but kind of well-known amongst the old-timers like Jim and Doug here. <laughs> Wait, what? I, they're not in business anymore, I don't think. I don't think they are. I, I, I doubt it. I, I can't. I don't know. I know they used to have a big sign that said, if in doubt, ship it out. <laughs> Great. <Yeah. laughs> ah, Bushmasters. Uh, we have uh, two Stenophorus and five Muta. Um, one of the Stenophorus we're actually sending down to another zoo to exhibit. Um, we have a quite large one that does well on exhibit, and we're exhibiting our smaller one right now. Um, and then we just got the Muta. They're actually owned partially by a Venom client uh, in Europe who was really after us to try to find them for a while. And it took us a while, but we did finally um, get some. And they're, man, they're neat snakes. They're, uh, they're just so, I don't know. I, they kind of remind me of um, Haboos a little bit. The um, Protobothrops flaviviridis and their mannerisms where they're kind of, you know, they sit there and they don't really look like they're that big or impressive because they're all coiled up. And then when something gets them excited there, you realize they're actually five feet long or, or longer, <laughs> whatever they are. Um, and they also, even though they're shy, um, they don't really seem to be extremely fearful snakes. Um, and I, I, I don't mean to say, like, I think the stuff about them stressing and you having to be gentle with them, I think all of that is true. But they're not, um, you know, like a cobra will run away from you. Um, a rattlesnake will run away from you a lot of times, or at least, like, try to back up away from you. Um, but habu are the same way, where they're just kind of like, you know, what are you? I don't know what's happening. I'm going to just crawl up to this and check it out. And the Bushmasters kind of remind me of that because they don't really, they don't really seem ultra fearful. It's kind of interesting in the, the way they behave, I think is, is a little bit different. Um, I kind of like that. I think it's kind of neat that they, that they act that way. So Haboos are some of my all time favorite snakes. I just, I really like that mannerism that they have of being kind of um, inquisitive and not as fearful. There's my other cat. <laughs> so yeah, those are the only two that we've got though. Um, we don't have the black headed ones or anything. You're typing. Are you typing something? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I would say that roughly I don't know, somewhere between a half and two thirds of our Venom clients are, are not in the United States. Um, certainly there's several places in Europe we've sent Venom to. Um, and uh, um, South Africa, uh, some in Australia, some in, in different places in Asia. So, um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's a small community of people who work with Venom and 
you know, if you if you only had if we only had customers in the U.S., we probably wouldn't be able to exist because <laughs> there aren't a, enough people doing enough things. Um, though there are a lot of young people who seem to be interested. Like at this last Venom Week, um, just before the virus hit, the man that meeting like made it right under the wire there. Um, there were a lot of young people who are interested and really doing some cool stuff. So um, that was kind of fun to see. I think the future of Venom production is probably has less and less to do with snakes as time goes on. I think that um, it's going to be, you know, the genes for it are going to be taken and put into to yeast or bacteria or something and, and made in that way. Um, and there was just that stuff done last year. Was that at, at Liverpool where they um, they took the whole like venom and they were able to, to reproduce it without the snake? Uh, that was that's pretty incredible. And I think that's probably the way it's going. Um, you know, sometimes we get people, and I know this has happened to Doug too, where we um, people call and they, they think they're, you know, I, I see a lot of rattlesnakes in my backyard, so probably I can do well you know, selling venom and it's like, you know, it, it's not how it works. <laughs> there aren't any venom producers who are, you know, wealthy and <laughs> we're all kind of struggling and doing all of these other things in order to to survive. And that's just that's just kind of how it is. It's not uh, not any different, I think, um, no matter where you are in the world. Um, but it, it is something that I think is, you know, a good thing to work with and it's really encouraging to me to see a lot of uh, younger people who seem to be interested in it so that that's definitely a, a neat thing um, but yeah I don't I don't know I think in another you know 10 or 20 years the, the venom production world is going to look very different especially if they're really um, find some cool things in spiders or cone snails or those animals that produce a lot less yield if they can make that venom without having the animal, that's amazing. So, ah, what to dry venom? We think something like, you know, 70 to 80% of it is water. Um, I don't ever weigh it really when it's wet. Doug may actually be able to answer that question better than I can. I, I only really weigh it or quantify it in any way once it's been lyophilized. So um, it does vary because, you know, different proteins weigh different amounts, obviously. So it does, you know, it's not a, a strict thing from one animal to the next, but I've never bothered to really look <laughs> carefully at like, you know, what's the volume when it's wet versus how much is it when it's dry? I can kind of eyeball it and be like, oh, that's probably a gram and a half or so. Um, but it's, I'm not, I haven't ever bothered to, to get an exact amount. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's priced dry, dry weight um, by the gram. So, and someone was asking me the other day about like, how do we determine what we charge for things? And uh, I use kind of three different things. The first one is how easy is the snake to, um, oh, it was you. <laughs> well, I will tell everybody, um, how easy is the snake to get? Um, and then to keep alive. So if it's really difficult to acquire or really difficult to keep healthy, then that's more expensive. If the yield is higher, then that makes it cheaper because it's easier to get. And then also kind of the danger factor. Um, and I mean, that's obviously somewhat subjective, but for us, it's more like what, if a serious bite is gonna cause like a lot of downtime or a lot of tissue damage, that's actually a, a higher risk in our mind than, you know, like something that that maybe is neurotoxic and dangerous, but isn't going to cause you to lose your hand if you mess up. So, um, you know, I think Jim would rather be dead than missing a hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, that's good. That's kind of yeah. <laughs> that's how he is. That's kind of how we figure it out. I think you were going to say something there, Doug, a minute ago, and then I kept talking. Do you want me to? I was going to say, no, I, I never tried. I mean, we would, um, you know, we would look at the venom when we took it out of the vial and just, you know, kind of do that. But we never did a comparison <clears throat> that I'm aware of between the two. And um, 
but to, to yeah, go back to what you, you were saying about the prices of um, of venom and these people who want to uh, extract from snakes, it's I always found the coral snake one uh, quite entertaining. It's like, oh, you know what that stuff goes for on the market? And it's like, yeah, have you ever extracted from a coral? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? You know, it's like, I. I applaud Jack for for doing it. I mean, that's a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. for such a little bit of, uh, and they're they're wormy little things when you you know I yeah. yeah I tried to do the tube thing and get them out of the tube and stuff and I found for me it was just easier to grab them and yeah you know, yeah uh, but uh, then again you know that that's uh well doesn't always work. It doesn't always work out well, well. and um, but yeah, that's just a again, it's a it's a lot of work for just very little payback, and uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I can't even imagine, you know, on those. I've never really seen what the stiletto snakes and stuff put out, but uh, it seems to me that'd be a small bit of yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, if and when you get them to, you know, when you extract conventionally, you put the snake's mouth where you want it. And then whatever the snake is going to do goes into the same place. So even right. if it has a small yield, at least the little drops will be all in a pile or all together. Yeah. But with the stiletto, you know, you can't just pick them up. So they're in a tube and they're mad. So they're like going like this. And then you're trying to get, you know, something. We were using, uh, I don't know, like Eppendorf tubes or something and trying to like gently put it up to the... Uh, to where they were flailing around and you know they're hitting like the, the surface of the ground they're hitting the tube they're hitting the side of the you know whatever you're collecting in instead of going inside of it and it it's really difficult i think you could maybe you know like use some foam covered forceps or something and try to manipulate them a little bit with those i don't know though. i mean they're so small i i don't know i got a lot of venom out of one and I actually want to try this again one time without intending to. I was uh, tubing it for something, maybe to probe it. And uh, it was a microlipidota, so it was a little bit bigger. But um, I accidentally put it too far through the tube so its head came out the tube like this, you know, like what I was just talking about. But then I was like, I really need it to come back a little bit. I don't want to have the dangerous part sticking at the end of the tube. <laughs> and so I was trying to just like, like I had a, a desktop, I think it was like the top of a shelf, and I was just trying to touch it, its nose gently so it would recoil backwards. But instead what it did was envenomate the crap out of the top of the shelf. <laughs> like it just, I mean, there was like a little puddle of venom there. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I don't know if maybe you could use a membrane or something and try to use that method. Um, you'd still have to pipette it up or something, obviously, but um, that's the most I've ever seen come out of one uh, was that instance. And of course I wasn't trying to collect anything <laughs> then. So anyway, <laughs> I made it mad. I didn't mean to though. <laughs> but, uh, oh, are you asking now about uh, like individual variation between um yes yes into like venom between in different individuals in the same species yes. that absolutely happens um and some of it i think we we understand and then some of it i think we don't understand i mean obviously there are some genetic differences between individuals so uh that's going to influence the, com the components that are in the venom and also i think and maybe more importantly um, expression of genes, uh, and, and this is like at the edge of my understanding of genetics, but I do know that how genes are expressed is sometimes more important than how there or than what genes are there. So uh, one snake might express more of a gene for a particular venom component than another, and then its venom composition will reflect that because that's the gene that's getting you know transcribed and used. Um, there also is a lot of difference based on the health and the hydration of the snake. We received some copperheads a few years ago that were confiscated from religious snake handlers who were, they, they weren't confiscated because the people were religious snake handlers, they were selling them illegally. And uh, they 
uh, had been holding the snakes in these little boxes with no food or water for a pretty extended period of time. And we attempted to extract from them kind of to prove a point. And something like 100 snakes gave like maybe a tiny little drop of venom. And that was because they were so dehydrated that there was nothing for them to produce venom with, uh, which is just really horrific considering the, the circumstance. Um, so definitely the health of the snake, I think, can influence uh, the, the amount of venom and the amount of protein that's in the venom. Um, and then again, <laughs> there's also a uh, variation that happens geographically. Um, I think there's variation that happens seasonally, though I'm not, I don't know if there's been a more recent paper on that. Um, but definitely, if you extract from snakes right after they come out of hibernation in the spring, the venom looks completely different than how it looks in the middle of the summer. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like, we're holding a lot of things stable uh, and stable between individuals, too. Like, they're kept basically the same way. Uh, you know, all of our Western diamondbacks are set up essentially the same. Um, but there definitely is things that are varying. Uh, I cannot remember the name of the person, but it's somebody in... Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, the name has totally escaped me and it's somebody I know and I'm embarrassed that I don't remember who it is. At Venom Week in Texas, Doug may remember, uh, there was a talk on um, Venom in uh, Horridus, how the southern Horridus have the um, neurotoxin and then the northern Horridus really don't. And the when whoever it was, uh, they had figured out that it might actually only be a point mutation. That's the difference between a uh, hemorrhagic and a neurotoxic venom. And that that one point mutation causes a different folding of the protein that then ends up being neurotoxic. So there might be some individual variation that's just simply random and I mean, almost certainly there is, but sometimes those random mutations end up having a big effect on the phenotype or the you know expression that you get um, in the venom. And if both work equally well to kill the food, then really, you know, it doesn't make any difference to the, you know, how well the snake can survive. Um, I thought that paper was really interesting, and I'm really irritated. <laughs> I can't remember who it is. I'll try to, I'll try to send it to you. Um, because it's probably, I think it's been published now more than just a talk. So it was super interesting. But yeah, I, I think it's something that we don't understand. I do know that they there is some thought that venom is uh, evolving rapidly in comparison to other sorts of genes. So, um, but again, my, my understanding of genetics is kind of like not the greatest. <laughs> There's a reason I work with live animals and not in the lab. What's interesting, Kristen, is I know this variation between the, the Horridus, the Northern, and the, yeah. and the bite that I took in 93 in Southern Indiana, my symptoms were uh, largely neurotoxic. Oh, really? That. Yeah, I had, um, you know, looking back on it, and uh, we actually wrote up some information on it, but... Uh, there was a lot of neurotoxic uh, effects to that. Certainly there was a lot of hematoxin, there was a lot of swelling and edema and, and such, but uh, it was a lot more neurotoxic than I uh, I thought would have happened to begin with. And um, of course that was my first snake bite, I didn't know what was gonna happen, but uh, <laughs> there's none of them I knew what was gonna happen. But um, uh, it just seemed to me, I. And I've had this conversation a lot, too, is I think we look at a lot of these uh, venoms and we say, oh, well, this is a, and I know it's it's uh, not really fair to say hemo or just neuro because there's all right, these other, right, right, right. Um, but, you know, when we think, oh, well, it's a hemotoxic effect, and I think that there's just, there's a lot of neurotoxic stuff going on in there that we just don't pick up on in, in a lot of these venoms, and um and I honestly, 
I think a lot of times too, when uh, a person succumbs to these snake bites, uh, it may be a lot more of the neurologic effects that, that cause the death than the hemotoxic effects that cause the death. Uh, one of my, my uh, atrox bites, I was in the hospital and everything was fine. Everything was great about three in the morning and literally my heart stopped and it was just out of nowhere, which was very strange for, you know, what I would consider a hemotoxic bite. Yeah. And uh, so that's what got me thinking about that. There's some of this, you know, some of these proteins are such a low molecular weight that we're just not picking up on them yet as, as our, yeah, as we get more sensitive equipment and we can look deeper into this, I think we're going to find that um, there's a lot more going on crossover between the chemo and the neuro than, than we formally thought. Well, certainly when you look at composition papers from the, you know, 70s and 80s, they're very different than, yeah. than what we can see now. And I'm sure that's going to be true a few more years down the line as well. Right. Um, you know, I don't know if we, if there have really been noticeable differences in siblings. I see your question down there. Um, we don't really do much analysis here, so it's only if a particular person, you know, like a researcher, asks us to do that. I have sent sibling venom to people, um, but as far as I know, that hasn't been published yet. So stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> We do have a pair of twin uh, nausea cuthia that came out of the same egg, and we've raised those up. Um, so it may be interesting to uh, to see uh, their venom at some point to see if it's actually identical. The snakes themselves don't look identical, but they're pretty close. I could I actually think I that's one of the few things I have a picture of on here. That'd be pretty interesting. Let me, hang on a second, I'll see if I can do that. Oh, yeah, I think I can share my screen. Hang on, I'll just try to make this big. Did that work? Could you see the picture? Yeah, it came up. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's them when they were like a year, about, probably not even a year old, like six or eight months old. They're females. Um, so, yeah, eh, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> it was fun to try to keep track of them when they originally hatched, because of course they were just in the box with all of the other eggs, and we saw both heads coming out of one egg, so we like tried to separate that egg out, but they were cobras in the eggs at the time. <laughs> so, yeah, but we did, we took that egg away so that it was, uh, you know, separated. We knew which which were the the twins. So it's been fun. They're probably eight years old now, or something like that. So <laughs> that would be interesting. You still can. Can, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> now it is fixed. <laughs> At the end of all the whole thing, it is now fixed. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been listening to you and watching, and at the same time I was trying to get this thing fixed. <laughs> yeah, um, I bet. Well, that at, at 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 least is yeah, at at <laughs> least at 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 least is good at this at this point in time. Uh, well, but we have kept you a lot. I'm 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 really sorry that this thing uh, the, didn't work out the same way that we intended to. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. but 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 I really enjoyed the presentation. I learned a lot, and uh, um, I don't. I, I know Doc doesn't need to <laughs> learn a lot of these things. He knows all these <laughs> stuff. Yes, but but <laughs> but but I think but I think Connor and and I enjoyed the. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. But it's great. I always learn something every time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I actually learned much more when you two guys were talking. <laughs> 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 yeah.
was kind of a nice but, excuse to talk to Doug for a little while too. So, hey. <laughs> no, but but you see, when you talk to us, everything is new for us. But when you talk, when you guys talk to each other, you say, "Oh, oh, oh." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Doug, uh, good hearing you, and uh, Connor, thank you very much for participating. You need some rest, <laughs> you go get some rest. <laughs> Christine, I, I really don't know how to thank you. Uh, really appreciate uh, I'm following you, everybody is following you, but, but I'm really surprised uh, why we didn't have more people in here. Anyway, that's um, yeah, that's fine. their loss. That's their loss. Um, well, thank you again very much. I appreciate for uh, being here. And if you have a any lasting words here that you want <laughs> <laughs> to send us away. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to do it. It's been fun. Uh, I don't know. Parting words. I feel like I should say something wise, but I don't. I don't know what that would be. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, be be nice to each other and don't get bit. How about that? <laughs> that is that is a good. <laughs> Well, thank you for setting this up. It was uh, we really enjoyed it. Well, I, I I really hope that we had more people, and I'm sorry that we didn't. We we had these little uh, microphone problems, oh. uh, and and actually the microphone might have been fixed half an hour ago, and I was still trying to type with the finger. <laughs> 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 anyway, well, thanks a lot, and please say hi to Jim. Uh, we we really appreciate both of you and what you are doing, and uh, it's really enjoyable seeing you guys um, doing such a wonderful job. Well, everybody, well, everybody, have a good night. Enjoy. Stay safe. Um, okay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.